Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching this talk. Um, I will try to make this you know, really interesting for you. Um, I'll try to be very efficient, very energetic, um, but most importantly, I'm gonna try to stimulate your mind because that's really what I'm all about. And so I wanna tell you about something that I'm, that I'm really excited about. Um, the title is A Formal Approach to the Development of Skills, Upping Our Games in Terms of Student Success. Um, it is as the Teaching of Psychology keynote that I get to do this, and I really appreciate that. Thank you, CPA, for giving me this, this honor. Um, this is something I'm really passionate about, and I think we're at a point in our research where um, it's really cool stuff to think about too with, with others like yourself. So I, I really hope I hear some reaction from some of you. If this is the formal presentation, I will be around afterwards for Q&A. Um, and so I look forward to chatting with the, some of you guys there, but let's just get into it. Okay, so very first, the first thing I wanna do is just sort of set the stage for the talk, give you a sense of where I'm coming from and, and why I think the stuff we're gonna talk about today is really, um, so timely and so important. Okay, so let's jump right into this. So first of all, there's this thing called COVID um, that hit. And I wanna begin by framing it in that context because of course so many of us have had to take our courses online. Now I had, I had taught online before, I've taught MOOCs online and I've also um, had some sort of blended, our intro psych at, at UT Scarborough is a blended learning experience. So largely online there too. Um, but, but like the rest of you, I am bringing some brick and mortar courses, a history of psychology course I'm teaching this summer, for example, online. Uh, I feel your pain. I understand um, how difficult it is. Within that mindset, um, here's how I would like to frame what we're going to do in this talk. I would suggest that there's three big components of every online uh, learning experience. And for the most part, with the great rush online, we focused on two. And I wanna highlight the importance of the third and show you a, a way of kind of harnessing that that's, that's I think more powerful than, than any other thing you could do. So what are the first two? Well, the first two are, you know, finding ways of presenting your content online. Um, and of course there are better and worse ways to do that. We could spend a lot of time about how to do that in the most engaging way, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, the other issue is of course, how do you assess learning, especially those high stakes assessment, the final exams and the midterms. Um, how can you do that online and have academic integrity at a fairly high rate, et cetera. Um, you know, also a lot we could talk about there. These are the two I think people rush to figure out, um, you know, as, as they got pushed online. How do I put the content up there? How do I assess the learning? Cool, important parts, and really the core, I guess you could say, of our, of our business model as universities. Um, but the third part is the real, well, it's the part that means a lot to me and the part I'm gonna focus on. So what are you doing aside from the lectures and aside from the assessments, what are you doing to really get your students working with the information that they're learning? Uh, because we know that that sort of active learning both deepens their, their learning of the content, but also that's where they get to exercise their transferable skills, their core transferable skills. And I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking to, the, to you about them today. Um, and so we're really gonna focus on that third thing, the, the active learning experiences you give your student in your online course, and how can you make those as rich and deep as possible? I'm going to suggest a way. Uh, but before we get there, yeah. Develop core transferable skills. What do I mean by core transferable skills? Um, well, before we get to what I mean, let me just make sure we're all on the same page on this following point right here. If you want to teach skills, you have to teach them differently than you teach information. I like to use analogies like this. You can learn a great deal about guitar playing in a one hour lecture. So you could sit there and someone could tell you a whole bunch of things about playing guitar and you could learn a bunch of facts uh, in an hour, especially if you found it engaging. Uh, if it was a good structured presentation, you could come out of there knowing a whole lot about guitar. But if you want to play guitar, if you want that skill of using the guitar, you're not going to get that in an hour and you're not going to get it by sitting and listening. You're going to get it only by doing, um, by playing. And that often means being not very good at first, uh, but through repeated practice, especially in a structured environment, a nice formally structured environment, as I'll, as I'll uh, hit in just a moment, those skills slowly get better. 
right? And, and that's the kind of learning experience we want to provide. But how do we provide that? And, you know, what are we even talking about? What skills? Um, this is a sort of grouping of skills that, you know, people talk about these in different ways. Um, cognitive, interpersonal, intrapersonal. This is one potential grouping. Um, I tend to boil these down a little bit more. So for the cognitive skills, if you look at a lot of the things in that, knowledge, I mean, it has things like knowledge there, um, but really critical thought and creative thought. Um, are, are two critical ones. There's some of these, by the way, active listening. I wouldn't have put in the cognitive. I would have put it more in, uh, in, in the interpersonal. In, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, the interpersonal. So anyway, we have these cognitive skills. We have these interpersonal skills, your ability to communicate with other people, which is both expressing yourself well, but learning to listen to others, learning to, you know, divvy up work and collaborate with them well. Um, so those abilities to work with others successfully. Um, and of course, intrapersonal, uh, often your ability to learn and develop and grow depends on your knowledge of yourself. Uh, and so it's a core, it's a core skill for, for little, literally personal development. And so these are the five I'm going to be highlighting. And I'm going to suggest that the same story as playing guitar applies to these skills. If we want our students to develop these skills, we have to give them repeated structured practice in a formal environment with lots of feedback. How do we do that? We'll get there. Uh, but these are the skills I'm talking about. All right. So a couple of um, things just I want to highlight. You know, these skills pre-COVID, these are websites from pre-COVID. Um, this was a core thing. We, we realized that the, the job market was very dynamic and changing. And so the notion was if we want to prepare our students to succeed in this uncertain future, which is even more uncertain now, these are the skills they need. I, I may call them the skills of success. You'll see me use that uh, term sometimes. If you're a good critical thinker, a good creative thinker, and a good communicator, and you know yourself well, you can succeed in almost any context. Um, and so, yes, these skills were critical pre-COVID. The economy is going to get tougher, um, and they're going to be even more important. So the federal government realized that. Even the Ontario government seemed to have realized that, even though they were a little, you know, less in in in. Um, ah. Let's not do politics, shall we? Uh, but let's just say, you know, even whether you're a liberal sort of perspective or a conservative sort of perspective, both sides understand how important it is for students to be ready to succeed in their careers. And both have actually made monetary um, investments to try to enhance that. So this is something that is timely uh, and maybe more timely than ever to develop these these skills. OK, so. We're going to get to the how we're going to do it. But just before we get to the how we're going to do it, I just want to have some odds and ends and then we'll have the context all set. OK, so what are these odds and ends? This is, by the way, a very, I'm teaching history of psych I, I mentioned to you and you get to learn stuff while you teach. Who would have thought that? <laughs> you learn all kinds of stuff. Um, so one of the things I learned early on with Wundt and his inverted U um, curve and how it applied to all th sorts of things, and he worked with, uh, or, or well, Berlin actually, he didn't work with Berlin. Berlin actually took those ideas and adapted them and created this hedonistic inverted U, which can be applied to all sorts of things. I want to talk about how it's been applied in the skill world. Um, and it's sometimes seen as um, reflecting the sort of payoff for investment in that world. What, what I mean by that is when somebody begins learning a skill, imagine this is the time they're putting into practicing that skill. Early on in the, in the skill acquisition process, they put in time, but they don't get a lot of payback. This is sort of how pleasurable the results are. I'm going to interpret that as do they feel like they're getting a return on their investment. So imagine yourself doing something like picking up guitar and saying, I want to try to play. And you practice and you practice and practice. And in fact, I, I think this part of the curve is generous. The reality is it would be very flat for a while before it starts to up curve. So it feels like that early practice isn't doing a whole lot. But if you stick with it and if you persevere, then you start to see the payoff. You start to see the upswing in the function um, and you're seeing big payoffs for the practice uh, that you're getting. And so this is when when it becomes fun right in this section. But in the early section, it's not fun. It seems like 
wow, I'm doing all this work and I'm getting nowhere. And so therefore often people quit right there. By the way, when you get to the other side of the curve, what's this saying? Well, again, it's time spent practicing. And once you're really, really good, you know, once you, you've, you've reached a really high level of guitar, now if you put in a whole lot more time, you don't get very much better anymore. And so once you're very, very good, once again, it starts to feel like less payoff for practice because you just can't get that much. You're the diminishing returns zone. Okay, so that's kind of cool, but I really want you to think about this. Early in the acquisition of a skill, if we leave it up to the person, they will often bail because they're not feeling the payoff for their work. We cannot allow them to bail. The reason we often put people, or put people, put our children and stuff into formal learning programs is because there's the structure there to keep them going. And if they keep going for a certain amount of time, then they take off and it gets fun. We have to think of this as well in terms of teaching critical thought, creative thought, etc. Okay. Related to that directly is this notion of how formally we develop the skills. Now I'm going to be arguing for a very formal approach here. So you can learn hockey with kids in your neighborhood, playing in the way these, these guys are on the left. And you can actually get pretty good. I'm, I'm not suggesting you don't learn in this environment. You certainly do learn in this environment and you can get pretty good, but you're probably not gonna get to the NHL just doing this. If you wanna be the best, if you wanna reach a really high level of skill, you need something much more structured. You need a more formal learning experience where you drill certain skills and have the repetition and the feedback that you need to really, really improve. Um, and so this is what I'm arguing we need in education. We need a formal, structured approach to developing skills in our students. Um, and that's what I'm going to argue I'm going to present to you today. Okay, so here we are. That was all background. Skills are important and we need to be formal about them if we want them to develop. So now what I'm going to do for the remainder of the talk is I'm just gonna start with, with just to, to be clear of where everything fits with a sort of standard contrast of you know what we're doing now um, often in our classes to do the sort of active learning part that I've been talking about. But then I'm going to present um, this, this alternate process, a process based on what I'm gonna call formative peer assessment. Um, and, and I'm gonna show you how it compares and I'm gonna highlight why it provides that sort of learning environment we need for skill development. Um, I'm gonna end up making a bunch of strong, strong claims about this when I'm done, um, and which you, know, you shouldn't believe unless you see some data. Uh, well, you can believe it if it makes sense, I guess. Um, but all the better if you see some data that kind of supports um, the contentions I'm making. So I'm going to show you some data at the end of this to kind of support everything I'm arguing. Okay, so I've, I've held you in suspense. I've suggested there is this way to do things. Now it's time to, to see what that way is. So let's start with... I don't know what that little triangle is. Interesting. Anyway, let's start with the traditional kind of approach that I want to contrast it with. And the traditional approach is we ask students to create something. This could be an essay. This could be a, a lab report. This could be, um, you know, any sort of composition. And, and what we hope is that students will do some research to do this. They will think you know, have to think critically about how to present things in the right way, a nice structured argument. They are gonna work on their communication, right, to say what they're, what they're saying. And so it is an active learning experience and it is exercising some of these skills I highlighted. So I'm um, certainly, certainly not suggesting this is, is um, bad in any way. What I'm going to suggest is this is like kids playing hockey in the neighborhood. Yes, it does what we want. And yes, if we just give writing assignments or various other assignments to our students, yes, they will exercise these skills and yes, they will get a little better. But what I'm going to argue is we can do a lot better for our students. And so here's a process I'm going to tell you about. It's called formative peer assessment. It starts the same way. Give students some composition to create. Um, and it can be a you know very open-ended composition. It can be anything you want. I'm going to be a little kg on the word composition notice i'm not saying writing piece because it can be anything you ask students to do and hand in but rather than in the first case they handed it in to the professor and the professor graded it in this case this is just going to be the first step of a three-step process so they'll start with the composition and they'll submit it to a system 
Um, and let me just say at this point, there are a number of educational technologies that can manage the kind of process I'm describing. Um, I'm not going to focus on the technologies. I'm going to focus on the process and I'm going to focus on the, the empirical data. OK, so yeah, imagine students grade some composition, they submit it to a system. Now, once they've done that, they log into the system again and they're going to actually see the work of some of their peers randomly presented. Uh, sorry, randomly selected, anonymously presented. And we are now going to walk them through an analysis of each peer work. We're going to ask them to answer certain questions about that peer work. And with the questions we ask them, we can exercise certain skills. We can you know, ask questions that require a certain kind of thought in order to answer. I'm going to be a lot more clear about this, but let me start with the generic process. So imagine students are now going there and they're seeing, let's say, five or six periodic compositions and one by one, they're analyzing these compositions. And as they do so, they are exercising these skills in this context of peer review. Now, while they're assessing a bunch of peers, let's say five, five peers are also assessing their work. So in the third phase, they're going to see the feedback that their peers provided. And once again, we are going to guide them through an analysis of that feedback. Um, that analysis will once again exercise these skills that we want them to exercise. And once again, they're going to have to do this analysis on every piece of feedback, all five of them. So the fact that it's five is giving that repetition, right? They're repeatedly exercising these skills, but now we have them exercising them in the first in the context of different peers, which helps to generalize the learning, but also in, in two very different contexts you know, sort of mental sets, one providing feedback to peers and the other learning from the feedback that you received. Um, and so there's going to be a whole lot of drilling of skills going on here across different contexts, exactly the kind of thing you need to, to um, build up a skill because it's going to provide that repeated structured practice. Now, after students have analyzed all the feedback, you can then say, okay, here's your original one. Here's the thing you submitted back here. You've now had a bunch of peers tell you how it can be better. You probably didn't agree with everything they said, but you probably agreed with some of the things that some of them said. Use those things and make your work better. Go ahead, improve your work. That's called the formative use of feedback. And that's when people really see the value of feedback, when they see that their work is actually better. It, it's, it's been improved. Uh, and so it's a critical step in really teaching them how to, how to use feedback and learn from it. Um, and so they do that, they revise their work, and they submit that. And this is what the professor marks. Okay, so now let's look at this sort of stand back. What did the professor do here? Well, they created some prompt for composition, and then eventually there was a composition that they had to grade and provide comments on. What happens over here? Well, they create a prompt for composition. Eventually, there's a better composition than they would have gotten, one that's benefited from peer review, um, that they are going to have to grade. Now, I also suggest that they grade the quality of the feedback students are giving. So there may be a little bit of additional work for the professor, uh, but I assure you the pedagogy that they get is more than worth the little bit of additional work to actually look at the, the quality of the comments of, of the feedback. Okay, So from a professor's perspective, these two are largely the same. Why? Because this is all driven by students. Um, they are the ones giving feedback to their peers and then getting the feedback from their peers. And so this is active learning at its best. It is assessment as learning. Um, and, and the really cool thing, and I'll show you some data uh, related to this, students like it and appreciate it. They like to see the work of their peers. They like to learn from the work of their peers. It gives them a real clear sense of how their work fits. So we have an active learning situation that students like. Okay, that's the, th the three-step process. I'm now going to walk you through this a little bit more and decompose my, my argument about skills. So we're just going to focus on, on this process now. And let's just kind of jump into it one at a time. And, and let me explicitly kind of make that skills argument for you. First of all, create phase. Well, in this case, when it comes to skills, it's largely up to the instructor. So basically, the instructor defines some sort of composition that's 
intended to provoke students to exercise some relevant skill set. Now, now one of the things, you know, once we formally do this, we're going to start thinking this way as instructors. We're not just going to think, oh, I'm going to ask students to do this because that seems like a good thing to do. Um, we're going to say, what's the skill we want? Oh, let's let's work on creative thought here. So what's a good prompt we can give students to be creative? Like maybe we show them all a, a summary of a psychology experiment. Um, and then we say, imagine you're our grad student, propose a next step. What would you do next? You know, and that would that would um, push sort of uh, creative thinking. We could just as easily ask them to sort of critically analyze an experiment. That would be more critical thought, right? So we can decide what we want to do. We do it. Um, we, we set up an activity that's meant to encourage that thought. The conscientious students will do what we hope they will do. So they will dig in, they will get that exercise of the skill. Um, and, and what you'll see is in the phases that follow, they will get that amplified. So just for this um, situation, let's assume we did that first one, the creative thought one, where I said, what would you do? What would be the experiment you would do next? Let's imagine we ask people to do that. So we're pushing them to think creatively. Okay, cool. And again, some students will do that really well. Other students will just give us some sort of half-hearted attempt. Keep that in mind. That's what they submit. Okay. Now, a little side note here. We are used to asking students to submit written pieces. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with, with uh, you know, writing teaches students a lot about thinking and communicating in structured ways. Um, and it pushes them to think critically and sometimes it pushes them to think creatively, all those sorts of things. So writing is great. Um, I would also just mention the nice thing once we go to a digital platform is that we can give students the option to communicate in other ways. Um, they can express themselves in images or sounds or videos or create a spoken word song or create a song song, etc. This can often be a way of really kind of allowing students to escape the sort of drudgery of a typical university assignment. You can ask them to do something kind of fun and interesting um, and engage them in, in that step. You could also leave it up to the student and bring in that element of choice that we know enhances the pedagogy, right? When a student has some feeling of, of agency in terms of deciding what they're gonna do and how they're going to do it, um, that tends to make the, the activity more engaging for them. So, you know, all this to say, sure, we can be thinking written activities, but we can be thinking composition in that general sense. Um, some great ways to enhance pedagogy here. Okay, that was my side note. So now we're on step two. Students have all submitted their work and they're coming to the assess phase. So let me just be kind of clear how this works. Imagine I am a student. I submitted my composition. Now I'm here to assess. Five students, the work of five students, I should say, the compositions submitted by five of my peers are selected randomly from the pool. Um, and those are the ones I'm going to see. Uh, they're presented anonymously. They have no identifying information. So all I can see is the actual work these five students submitted. But that anonymous thing is really nice, by the way, for a number of reasons. First, it just gets rid of bias. If you can't see a name, you don't know the gender of the individual, you don't know the cultural background of the individual, all you know is their work. And therefore, any biases you have cannot come into play. And they, upon receiving you know, your feedback, know that. So they know it's just about the work. So they're not confused like, oh, this guy's just saying this because I'm a woman. Well, no, maybe they are, maybe. And you don't know that's a guy anyway. That could be a woman saying that to you. So it's just about the content of the work. And that kind of makes it much more sort of intellectual and focused. The other cool thing about anonymous feedback, and there's a lot of research showing this now, is that um, people give more direct um, easy to parse feedback when it's anonymous. When they know the people, when they can see the names of the people they're giving feedback to and they think that person might know them, then they become much more socially couching in their in their terms. They, they don't want that person to be upset with them and angry with them in real life. And so they take pains to be, you know, really nice and or friendly or socially couch things, which can make the point that they're trying to make get kind of lost. And people have trouble pulling it out. But when it's anonymous, then people tend to say what they mean. Okay, so let's talk about that say what they mean. Here I am. Here's five of my peers. I see the first peer's work. 
And now I can be asked some questions about it. And this is where the instructor comes in and where you have a lot of flexibility about what you, what you do. Um, let me give you an example of a kind of question. You could tell this, this student, I want you to read this peer's work very carefully. And I want you to think of all the ways it could be better. But then I want you to zero in on the one thing that if they fixed, that would lead to the maximum improvement of their work. Tell them what that thing is but then also give them some sense about how they can fix it. And of course, do this all in a way that's with the right tone and such um, so that they'll actually want to listen to what you say and learn from it. Okay, so just to answer that question, we're going to have to engage critical thought to find that biggest flaw, creative thought to figure out how it could be improved, and then expressive communication to express this all to the, to the given um, peer, okay? So even if we were just asked that one question, you would engage those three skills when you did it with that peer, and then you'd engage them again, and again, and again, and again. Repeated practice. Structured, well, yes, it's the questions that provide the structure, and you don't just ask one question. You could do um, you know, a number of things. Please highlight something this person is doing very well. So now you're, you're looking for, again, it's sort of critical thought. What is something this person has done really well? And that will reinforce that positive attribute of the work in the student's mind that's, that's giving the feedback, right? They, they'll see all these good things. Oh, I should be doing more of that. Um, how good is this work relative to your own composition? Now you're explicitly asking the student to, to compare that work to their own work, which is a great way to develop metacognitive skills. Here's something I'm going to highlight at near, near the end of the talk with the research, but I want, to, I want to sort of throw it out there now and get you thinking about it. You could ask them to apply a rubric to the work. You know, let's say you ask them for a, an argument, to write an argument on one side or another of, of an issue. There are great rubrics that kind of spell out the structure a good argument has, what are the components of an argument, um, and what constitutes you know, not doing it well, doing it okay, doing it quite well, and doing it excellently. Uh, and so you could ask the students to apply this rubric. And now they're really kind of saying, well, how good is that student's argument? Well, what do I mean by that? Oh, here are the components. So they're learning the components of the argument. They're looking for it in the work of their peers. Um, and so whatever it is, like in this case, the argument, they're learning it really well by applying that peer. Uh, and you could even ask them, what grade would you give this if you were giving them a grade? Those are the sorts of questions you can ask that will promote their mind to think about the work in various ways. And, and once again, you know, they would answer all of these questions about the first peer, and then they would do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again. So in this peer review phase, they are already getting a lot of repetition and practice drilling their use of these skills. Cool. And this is just going to be one of the situations where we do it. Little side notes. I'm going to bring these in right now and then. One of the cool things, again, about digital tools is when you're giving instructions, the instructions can include digital resources. So if you are, for example, going to ask your student to give feed students to give feedback to each of their peers, what a great situation for um, teaching them what it means to give good feedback. So within the instructions itself, you can embed things like videos and create little micro learning opportunities. This is a video about how constructive feedback for managers, how you can give good constructive feedback. I like them for managers because it kind of brings that real world into it a little bit, right? Gives, gives a little bit of that experiential learning vibe to it. You know, think about using this skill in the real world. But again, now all students watch that video, which tells them how to give good constructive feedback. And if we do that before they give feedback to their peers, we're kind of calibrating them all, getting them all on the same page and teaching them what good feedback looks like at the same time. Um, so we have opportunities along this process to add little micro learning um, situations uh, that will really help the student both as they go through this process, but also learning a skill that's very valuable uh, in life in general. Okay, so where are we? We've had the great phase where people in our, in our condition were gonna propose that next experiment. 
we're in the assess phase where they're going to look at each of these peers and just to unpack this assess phase a little bit more you know each composition you have to you have to think about critically to, to answer these questions often you can involve creative thought by asking how things can be improved etc they all involve expressive communication because that's what feedback is giving feedback and again there's this doing it again and again and again that repeated structured practice okay so they've done this i as a student have given feedback to five of my peers let's say cool i'm done third phase third step here i am again this time five peers will have seen my work they saw it in the previous phase right and they went through and did what i did they they provided a bunch of comments on my work so now i am going to see the comments that the first peer assigned to my work and now once again by the way this is ah let me come back to this in just a moment i'll come back to this in just a moment but other than to say students are, are find this challenging this task of learning from feedback i will argue in a moment is not natural um, it's a difficult task for students and so in fact there's a lot of research that suggests if you just leave it up to students to learn from the feedback almost half the students won't even read the feedback um, and those that do read it seem to read it in a very surface kind of way uh, so if we want them to really learn how to learn from feedback we're going to have to scaffold it a bit. We're going to have to help them with this process. And so how do we do that? The same way we did it in the assess phase. We say, hey, listen, each piece of feedback, I want you to critically analyze it. And we ask them some questions. So for example, we might want to teach them this core thing I'm going to tell you that almost every time you get critical feedback, it feels crappy. It does not make you feel happy. It feels like somebody is telling you why your work is not as good as it could be. And that kind of feels like an attack. Um, it kind of gets our amygdalas going. I don't have to tell you guys about amygdalas. Um, gets our sympathetic nervous system going. And what do we want to do? We want to fight or flee, right? Uh, and so a lot of students flee feedback some of them maybe fight it they say i don't agree with this i don't agree with this what do we want them to do sit listen and learn not natural um, and so we guide them through it and one of the things we might do for example we might have a couple of questions that make the point i just made to students we might tell students feedback tends to make you feel crummy so you know what i want you to do the very first thing when you read that feedback here's a checklist of emotional states i want you to check everyone that you're feeling right after you read that feedback now it's two reasons to do that one is you tell the student the first way to deal with an emotion is to recognize it acknowledge it and once you've done that you can put it aside a little better so that's why i want you to do it but the other reason is the person that gave you that feedback is going to see the emotional reaction it caused it's going to come back to them and so that's going to help them learn how to give more feedback more effectively um, so we could ask them start with this emotional reaction but then put the emotion aside and focus on the utility of the feedback regardless of the tone regardless how it made you feel when you read this peers feedback do they give you some clear actionable ways of improving your work if they do their feedback is useful and so I want you to rate how useful the feedback is um, would you like to say anything back to this person about their feedback um, you know any thoughts that inspired in you that you'd like to reflect back to them you could do that you could apply a rubric there are rubrics for feedback you know certain qualities that feedback should have you could have the student actually score the feedback they received according to a rubric you could ask them what grade would you give or I mean if we get back to my sort of favorite skill thing I like to ask them the following one this peer told you a way your work could be improved if you did what they suggested how much better do you think your work would be to answer that question you have to start with receptive communication right listen shut up and listen to what that person said and then critically think about it what are they actually saying and then creatively imagine changing your work in the way they suggest what would it look like then and now you can answer this question of how much better or worse it would be but again receptive communication critical thought creative thought uh, with that one question and you bring in a bunch of questions and you can do all sorts of different um, kinds of you know pushing different um, 
uh, skills uh, to be used as you go through it. And whatever skills they have to apply when they look at the first piece of feedback, they do it again and do it again and do it again and do it again. So once again, exercising these skills in a drill-like way, but across slightly different contexts, different contexts of feedback. And this whole context is very different from the second peer review context. So it's a big change in context across two and three with little changes of context within each, all of which that skill is being repeatedly practiced and used. This is the kind of situation that builds skills. Okay. All right. I've already kind of made this point. Um, I think there is a whole lot of power in this third phase. And I think there's a whole lot of power because it's so unnatural. Most of us are not good at dealing with critical feedback. Most of the population are not good at dealing with critical feedback because our amygdalas are very sensitive and, and we feel hurt and, and we can't learn very well when we feel hurt. This was, um, you can find the whole article there on the bottom, but just to highlight, you know, this is certainly true when it's students um, consuming feedback. So 39% of students indicated they spent five minutes or less reading the feedback. There's another study that says, suggests 50% don't read it at all. So hey, uh, a total of 81% spent 15 minutes or less reading the feedback that they got. Um, they aren't thinking about what they might learn if they tried to respond to feedback. That is not what you think when someone's critically analyzing you. you. You don't naturally say, oh, let me stop and think about that because I bet there's something they just said that I could use to do better next time. Uh, that's what we want them to do, but that's not what they do. They go, oh, no, or you know, they get upset, they leave, or they say, no, that's not true. They fight or they flee. Um, but again, if you can teach them not to, and with that structured approach to having them analyze and use feedback, you know, we're making them kind of go through a process of analyzing that feedback and then using it to improve their work. Remember that Wundt curve, that Wundt Berlin curve? We are not allowing them to bail. We're saying, no, 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 you have to keep at this. And, and it's a structured approach, so you must continue. And you know what? Eventually, as you do this more and more, it's gonna start to be fun. You, <laughs> I don't know about fun, but you will see the, the payoff for the investment. You know, you will, and this is what's happened to all of us as graduate students, right? We got reviews back and we wanted to fight or flee. Um, but we eventually learned you come back to them and you take those words and you improve your article and my goodness, it's better. And then we do that again a second time and we do that again a third time. And eventually we reach a point where we assume those reviews are gonna help us improve, but it takes a while. It takes a while. We still don't like reviews, right? Do you like opening reviews? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's that same notion. So I just want to, you know, highlight that. That's part of the mojo of this structured approach is that it really kind of pushes people through this process and gets them to the point where they start to see the payoff for, for their learning. Okay. Um, so in this reflect phase, in this third phase, then, um, yeah, you have to analyze and whether, decide whether you agree. So it's receptive communication, it's critical thought, it's metacognition. Um, you have to, oh, I, I didn't mention this, by the way, after they analyze all the feedback, you then always should give students an opportunity to revise their work with that feedback, use it formatively. So now they have to think about, you know, how do I do that? Well, which comments do I bring in? Which do I don't? What do I change in my work? What do I not? So critical thinking, creative thinking. Um, and I often like, just like that letter to the editor, I often like after at the end saying, hey, I want you to now tell me which which peer comments you 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 changed your work to incorporate and which you ignored and why. Give me a good rational analysis of how you went about revising your work in light of this feedback. Uh, and by the way, it's really cool that peer feedback isn't always good because that's what's pushing students to kind of figure out if they agree with it or not. And when feedback comes from an expert, students just go, well, they must know what they're talking about. When it comes from a peer, they're like, I don't know. Uh, and so that's a great place for promoting critical thought. Yeah, you should know, you shouldn't trust your peers. You should think about it and decide whether you agree. Okay, so that's the process. Uh, and, and I know I kind of, um, you know, belabored that point a little bit, but I think there's so much in, in what I just said, so much sort of rich pedagogy, and I hope you agree with that. Um, and, and here are my big claims. This is why I'm so excited about this. Um, I believe that this process, 
sort of depicted on the bottom, uh, can be used to formatively develop virtually any skill that you can provoke with a question. If you can come up with a question that makes students engage that skill, then you can use this process to exercise that skill. I believe it can work in any context at any level of instruction. Why? This is a process. It's content agnostic. It can certainly work in psychology, but it can work in any area. There is nothing content connected to this. It's the process. It is our peer review process to some extent, right? Do you think a lot? Do you practice your thought while you're doing peer review? I hope you do. <laughs> I hope people do. Um, okay, and now here's going to be a cocky claim that I'm just going to throw at you now. Not only can it develop skills, but it can also provide an on-the-fly measurement of any skill captured by a validated rubric. And I think this is critical because I want universities to take skill development seriously, and they will only take skill development seriously if they can measure it. We accredit accreditate learning. If we can't capture that learning somehow and measure it, um, then a lot of the mojo is lost. And so um, measurement is important, but I don't think it's a problem. I think it can happen very quickly and easily in the context of this sort of uh, approach. How does that happen? Okay. So we're going to bring in rubrics here. Uh, and preferably validated rubrics. So if we stay in the skill world, um, the Association of American Colleges and Universities has developed these value rubrics. Um, and, and we've kind of been in close touch with them. They're, I'm good friends with uh, some of the people at AAC and U now. Um, and they've developed, in fact, 16 different rubrics related to the sorts of transferable skills people are interested in. You know, here's an example of four, the top four here. Um, but they have 16 rubrics related to almost any of these skills we talk about. And so the notion is this. Let's say we care about critical thinking. Okay. What if we, first of all, ask students to do some activity that, that exercises critical thought, right? So we maybe ask them to do a critical analysis of some scientific paper, some you know, psychological paper, find the flaws. There's at least six flaws in this paper, maybe 10 flaws in this paper, you know, find them, but also just critically analyze the paper in general. And so let's say we're going to focus on Jojo, the student here, but let's say here are the five peers work that they're assessing. So they're going to apply this rubric to these peers work. And while they're doing it, I call this ear training because it's like a musician listening to other musicians playing music and listening from that experience, right? Which is a big part of music training. I suggest it should be a big part of critical skills training too. have them look at other people trying to demonstrate that skill and have them score how well they do have them by, and they do that by applying that critical thinking rubric. So I think pedagogically, this is very powerful for Jojo, okay? But of course, Jojo also wrote a piece, and that piece was uh, assessed by these five peers. And these five peers all applied the critical thinking rubric to Jojo's work when they assessed it. So that means we have five independent measures of Jojo's critical thinking skills as determined by this rubric. There is a lot of research now that suggests that if you average together five or six peer assessments, they provide a valid and reliable measure um, that's online with what other expertise, experts in the field would measure. Uh, if that's true, then we can average these five scores and we have a measure of Jojo's critical thinking ability. And we have that just while they were all doing an activity. We didn't have to go ask them to do something else to measure their critical thought. We didn't send them off to the Cornell critical thinking test or anything like that. We just said, do this assignment. And then at the end of the assignment, we have the critical thinking score. Okay. Now, I thought 55 minutes seemed like a ton of time, but I got a couple of things I want to do now. So <laughs> what I want to do now is give you some data related to those claims. And virtually all the data I'm going to talk about is in this paper, which you can find here. So, and the slides will be available to you. So uh, I'm just gonna kind of jump into this and, and tell you about a few questions that we uh, asked. So first of all, okay, we've seen in the past that if you average a bunch of peer scores that they, are, they can be reliable, but is this really true when they're applying a rubric, especially a sort of general rubric like an AAC and U rubric? Um, that was our first question and here's the study we did. Uh, this is my intro psych student. So we had about 1,500 plus students complete an intro psych activity. It was about research ethics. Um, oh, so we had 1,500 compositions. We randomly selected 200 
of those 1,500. And those 200 were, we, we got a number of scores of this. So first of all, six peers had applied the rubric in the context of the activity. And so for each composition, we could have a peer average, right? A score based on the peer average. And that's the one we're kind of curious about. How good is that? Um, but in addition to that score, we also asked two teaching assistants um, to score all 200 compositions to allow us to get an idea of agreement and such between the two uh, teaching assistants. We also uh, paid for the services of two AACNU experts. So they have experts that have gone through a training program about how to apply these rubrics well. Uh, and so they are kind of our gold standard. And I also applied the rubric to each just to see where I fall in. Okay, so what did we find in this study? Uh, first of all, these are the overall averages. Um, and, and this is a score that could go as high as um, four. <laughs> Yeah, four, <laughs> four. Okay, there's the four there. Um, and here's the one thing I want you to notice is that the, the experts, the, these are the AAC and U experts, they're pretty tough. The TAs relatively are, are easier. I'm sort of, so this is the expert average, okay? So I'm sort of where the TAs are, I'm very similar. So there's me and the TA average and the expert average here. Uh, and the peers are more generous than any of us. Okay, so that's one of the things. There is a bias that peers tend to overestimate. They give a higher score than experts would. That's a fact. Um, but here's the kind of cool thing. And when we look at correlations and kappas, okay, so just to make sure everyone's clear on that, correlation is sort of, if, if we have two experts score these, do they tend to rank order them the same? Are they in the same relative positions in the list, how, how certain ones come out? Whereas Kappa is, are they in the exact same positions in the list? If this one was ranked first, is it also first for the other expert and second and second? So Kappa, you know, it's harder to get a high level of Kappa, but Kappa is absolute agreement. Um, Pearson correlation is relative agreement. What we see with the experts is they're really good on both. Okay, you give two experts these same things. And for, for written work, by the way, these are good. Scores. I know they don't look you know, hugely fantastic, but they're good. And the experts are doing good with both. The teaching assistants are doing good in terms of their correlation, but they have um, not so good in terms of kappa. Why? Well, you might have noticed if I flip back here quickly, these TAs are, this one's more generous than this one. Okay, it's giving higher scores than this one. And so that's what's really causing this to be a little lower. Um, one TA is giving higher scores and so the scores are not absolutely matching um, there's a shift of a sort but their relative rank is right within the list does that all make sense i hope so um, now these, these are sort of the this is sort of our, our standard right and universities this would be a really high standard if we could reach it and so the question is now how does it look when we look at the peer averages so this is the correlation of the, and the kappas with the peer averages with with each of these three and let's just really focus on this part of that because these are just the individual uh, people here so if we look at the expert average um, with the kappa so did the did the peer average um, predict in relative terms the expert average rating yes it did uh, pretty well. It also predicted my rating pretty well, and it also predicted the TA rating pretty well. Again, in terms of the relative, so the ones that the peers thought were good, we also all thought were good, but it, the, the peers thought they were better, right? So when we look at the absolute scores, we're not seeing a lot of absolute agreement here, uh, but we are seeing relative agreement. And so that's sort of the punchline with with applying the rubrics. Um, and my story, by the way, just is as you become more expert, you get better at seeing things, right? That that are like a lack of critical thought. And so the less expert you are, you miss some things. So that's why you tend to be over generous um, when you're not an expert. But that's what we're seeing. They're more generous, but they're still getting the rank ordering right. And so therefore. You know, if we're just looking to see who's especially high in terms of critical thinking in our class, we can trust those numbers to tell us those sorts of things. Okay, cool. So that's one thing. And then the next question um, is this, how scalable is it? And what do faculty and students think about the process? Okay, scalable first. 
Um, in the second uh, study that we describe in that paper, we describe how we had 14 different professors, literally a lot from Ontario, but some as well from, well, one from, uh, well, some from America and some from the Netherlands, Utrecht University, 14 different faculty, um, nine used it in one class, four used it in two classes, and one used it in three classes. So it was a total of 20 classes. They were all over the board in terms of area, and they were all over the board in terms of level, first year to master's. Um, and we just asked all of these people to try it in their class um, as part of the study uh, and to give us a little bit of feedback. And so here's what we, we found from the faculty members. Um, you know, this, so, so did it work for all of them? Do they feel like it was all right, given they're all over? Do you think students learn more using this process than with a traditional approach? Seven point scale. Uh, I'm going to just sort of look at the bottom here for the, for the uh, you know, uh, what's it called? Key. Um, so the green is if they said five, six, or seven out of seven. Blue is if they said one, two, three. Four is neutral. Everybody's on the positive side. Um, th they feel they learned more using this modified approach. Um, do they think it's scalable? Do the professors think it's scalable to any area or level? Yep, they do. Will they continue to use it now that they've tried it? 93%? Yep. Would you like to see more courses adopt this approach? 93%? Yes. So we're getting nice clear endorsement from faculty who have tried it, that they see the value of what it offers. What about the students that went through? Um, are you willing to do additional work of this sort to develop your transferable skills? 79% said yes. I'm gonna argue that's a really powerful number. Should universities put more focus on developing skills? 80% of students think we should. Does the process you just experienced seem like a good way to develop these skills? 70% think it is, okay? So, I mean, on the most modest level, what we can say here is there's no revolt, okay? The faculty like it, the students like it, um, and there's already previous evidence that we have that shows that it actually has the impact we claim it should have. Um, and so this is really cool. Why? Well, because often what we call active learning, students call additional work. And especially when the work is unfamiliar, it feels to them like we're making them jump through hoops. Um, and so the fact that this is active learning that they're embracing uh, is, is really powerful and really important. Okay. Um, I did, yeah. Okay. Let's leave it there. All right. Oh, well, I have the, I'm not going to have the full time to do the, this part. I thought 55 minutes was a lot, but I'm going to give you some rapid rounds. We do, we do a lot of experiential learning. We want to send our students out to work with others um, in, in a corporate environment or something like that. That works out really good if they have good skill set to bring. Uh, but if they don't have a good skill set, then it's, it's bad for everybody. So my argument is we should be doing things like formative peer assessment early to get students critical skills to the point that when we do bring them to experiential learning, their skills are developed enough for success. These are gonna be rapid rounds. Um, we can do things like um, a form of badging. So we could say, you know, that critical thinking situation I just described, let's say a certain student, every time a critical thinking rubric is implied, they're in the top 10% of the class in critical thinking. Um, we, we could put that on an extracurricular record. We could start to have our digital portfolio or something like this where we acknowledge the strengths that certain students have and they could use this to help them get jobs that fit them well, etc. Okay. Um, and then this one. <laughs> okay. Imagine this is a program and imagine different people are using this skill in different situations and maybe they're applying different rubrics. So imagine in these courses, they measure critical thought by doing this process with critical thought. And in other ones, they measure creative thought. And in other ones, they measure oral communication. You know, you can do all these skills. Here's how you can now use this data intelligently. Let's zoom in on this class up here. Fourth year class. Um, and let's say we're measuring critical thinking and we find that some people are doing better than others in this critical thinking. And we do a path analysis. And maybe we find that the ones that are doing really well at critical thinking here all took this course. We don't know what's going on in this course, but whatever's going on in this course, it's having a downstream effect that's positive. So maybe we should know what's going on in this course, and maybe we should find out what that professor is doing, and maybe we should try to have more of it. So the point here is if we start to measure these skills throughout our program, we can start to, in a very intentional way, 
um, optimize the skill development we're providing our students. You know, that's the real uh, sort of goal of all this. All right, cool. So in summary, um, yeah, I think there's a strong appetite for, for developing these skills. I think um, when we use technology-enabled peer assessment, we need technology to, to do all the logistics, um, but that is a very powerful, in fact, I think the most powerful um, approach to, to skill development. When we combine this with rubrics, we can even measure this skill while enhancing the learning even more. I claim we can apply this to any context. Um, and given that both faculty and students like it, it actually is scalable in that sense too. People will use it. Cool. I thank you very much. Um, this is my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, I think you're gonna get a copy of the slides anyway. Um, but I can give you some uh, PDF of a chapter and research paper that connects with what I said. And heck, if you're interested in using this process, uh, I would love to hear from you as well. So that's it. Three seconds left. Excellent. I'm done.